Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, the Deputy Labor Leader, Tanya Plibersek, Greens Leader, Richard Di Natale, the Daily Telegraph's National Political Editor, Shari Markson, Pakistani-born English novelist, Camilla Shamsi, whose latest novel, Home Fire, explores a family whose only son goes off to Syria to join ISIS, and the Minister for Law Enforcement and Cyber Security, Angus Taylor. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. Now, Q&A is live in Eastern Australia at ABC TV and live on iView and News Radio 9.35 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. And you can stream us on YouTube, Facebook and Periscope. Our first question tonight comes from Jackie Pollock. Evening. My question's about rumours. I work as an executive coach and I help leaders to create really respectful work cultures. By contrast, last week, we witnessed Michaela Cash using slurs and innuendo and threatening to reveal rumours that would undoubtedly have caused personal damage to other women. This does not model mature leadership. And it sets a really poor example for our young people, some of whom have been subjected to outrageous rumours in cyberspace and sometimes with really tragic consequences. What's the panel's view about this slide in standards? And how can our politicians set a better example? Start with Tanya Plibersuk. Well, we can set a better example by not doing it, by not behaving that way. And I thought um, Michaelia Cash last week really overstepped the bounds of uh, common decency. But, you know, we work in a very conflict-filled workplace in Parliament House. Traditionally, staff have been left out of that because as parliamentarians, we can stand up, we can defend ourselves. Staff don't have that uh, opportunity to, to set the record straight. They don't have the forums of the parliament to do that. So I think Michaelia Cash shouldn't have gone there in the first place. She should have apologised much more. Well, sh she should have withdrawn much more quickly than she did. I don't think she has apologised yet for her comments. She did unreservedly withdraw her remarks. Do you accept that at least? Oh, I think that's a step forward. It did take way too long. Taking 24 hours to do that is way too long. But she should apologise to those young women. I mean, these, these young women, they work so hard. You've got no idea how hard. I know people think parliamentary staff don't work hard. They do. They work 14-hour days, 16-hour days. They're always on the road. They're away from their families. Uh, they cop a lot of pressure and to, to get that sort of personal disparagement and have to go and explain it to their friends and their family. Are you, are you, were they talking about you? What did they mean? It's terrible. It's just, it's just not on. Angus Taylor. Well, she did apologise, oh, so withdraw unreservedly, of course, and, and, and that Could was she have apologised because right. she didn't Well, she, she withdrew. I mean, we can split hairs about words, but she withdrew same. unreservedly, and, and that was important. She, she should have done that. But look, the, the Parliament didn't cover itself in glory last week. Doug Cameron didn't cover himself in glory, and nor did Kim Carr. And uh, it's true that there are times when we, we need to keep the standards higher, and frankly, stop getting so absorbed in the Canberra bubble, start focusing what people out there in the community want us to do. I got into politics to focus on what was in the public interest and the national interest, not into the infighting in Canberra. We do seem to be stuck in a bubble, but um, you have to ask whose fault that is. Well, you can ask whose fault it is, but at the end of the day, it's, it's everyone's job who's in Canberra to fix it. Tony, Tony, can I just correct something? Kim Carr did the wrong thing and he apologised, yep. he should have. Doug Cameron didn't. He was asking some tough questions about movements of staff between offices and between agencies that the minister was responsible for uh, in, a, in a way that was perfectly reasonable. It was nothing to do with the personal lives of staff or anything. He was asking legitimate questions about expenditure of public funds and staff being moved back and forward between the Australian Building and Construction Commission and these other places that the minister's responsible for. That is fair game. That well, is Prime the Prime Minister said uh, that he was bullying Oh, uh, well, Cash. I think people can watch that for themselves. Michaelia Cash is pretty good at standing up for herself. Doug's um, questioning was very calm and very reasonable. OK, I'll come to Richard. I'll go back to get a response from uh, the Minister. Go ahead. Well, Tony, you mentioned the Prime Minister. Uh, the Prime Minister only a few weeks ago stood up and said to Australians, we need to create a more respectful work environment, for, particularly for women. It's a tough place, Parliament, and it's especially tough for women. It's tough on families. It's a really macho, toxic culture a lot of the time. And the Prime Minister a few weeks ago said we have to create this environment. And when he needed to stand up and show some leadership, 
and to condemn those comments and to ensure that Michaelia Cash apologised, he defended them. He defended those comments. And it's, it's part of a pattern with this Prime Minister. When he's required to stand up and show leadership, he always takes the soft political option. He doesn't want to alienate his support. And so what you get is this hopelessly, conflict, hopelessly conflicted Prime Minister when, when the country needs him to stand up and make a statement and back up the words he uttered only a few weeks ago with strong action, he was missing in action. Angus Taylor, you, you, I, no doubt you want to respond to that. Keep it brief. Well, uh, the, the Prime Minister didn't defend those comments. She, he made the point that Doug Cameron wasn't covering himself in glory. And, and I stand by that. But point. look, the most important thing here is let's get beyond all this insider stuff. What's important here is the underlying focus we have to have every day on good government and, and governing in the national interest. But, and I but, think we're spending too much time yeah. talking about ourselves and not talking yeah. about what... I, I agree was. with you, Angus, but you've also got to remember people in positions of leadership, our words matter to people and particularly to young women. And when you, when you make a comment like that, this was the former Minister for Women making those comments. Just, we've got a, we've got a young woman, the uh, Prime Minister. We've got a young woman, Richard, who wants to respond to this. Same question. Erin Morrison, go ahead. Good evening. Um, with International Women's Day approaching, uh, the spotlight is once again on the protection and advancement of the interests of young women such as myself. Um, do you believe that the comments made last week by Michaelia Cash have the potential to undermine efforts made to improve accessibility and equality for women such as myself hoping to advance in politics or women already in politics? Let's start with our non-politician, Sherry. Yeah, I think those comments uh, were really unhelpful in that it, it's not going to exactly encourage women to want to enter politics, either as a politician or as a political staffer. It, it was a brutal wake-up call for uh, young... She called them young women. They're not all young. They're 20s and 30s who work in Bill Shorten's office. Very smart, bright women. Some are Harvard-educated, uh, really great women. Why would they enter a career in politics? Why would the next generation want to if by the former Minister for Women they're going to be um, accused of these unsubstantiated slurs? It is so inappropriate. It is such a difficult environment anyway for women. Uh, I interviewed another... Um, a coalition advisor for a story in the Daily Telegraph in Friday's paper, and she spoke about just how tough it is to survive in this environment. It is cutthroat. Uh, it is, as Tanya said, 14-hour days or longer. It's high pressure. There's constant crisis to deal with. Uh, and the last thing you need is, is slurs being thrown at you, even though uh, it is the case that Michaelia Cash uh, whether it was right or not, and of course Doug Cameron's denied it, she did of course believe uh, that Doug Cameron was questioning her staff uh, because of you know, various rumours that had been spread about them. So her staff had been the subject of rumours within Parliament House, which is as well unacceptable. Now, I, I don't think personally that's what Doug Cameron was doing. He was talking about, as Tanya said, the movement of staff um, between her office and the Registered Organisation Commission, and this flew on. You know, this was a line of questioning he'd been pursuing since uh, late last year when one of her media advisers was sacked um, or offered his resignation after leaking to the media about an AFP raid. Yeah, Carmilla, you've been travelling here over the years. How, looking at this um, in the little time that you've been here this year, um, how does it look to you, Australian politics? Very odd. Um, <laughs> because, I, you know, I was coming to Australia quite frequently um, some years ago, but it's been a gap of, of eight years. And I arrived three days ago and I've been reading the newspapers and I'm thinking, what has happened in those eight years? It's not that everything was all pleasant and lovely, but there has been, it seems, a shift in tone. There's a friend of mine from London, we were at the Adelaide Writers Week yesterday, and she'd been reading the newspapers and she said, you know, this makes Westminster politics look all very tame and polite by comparison. <laughs> um, and I think in regard to women in Parliament, it's a particularly troubling thing. I mean, in Britain this year, it's 100 years since women, well, at least some women got the vote. Um, and the thing you really notice is it's been 100 years and you look at the representation of women in Parliament and it's so incredibly low. And time and again, those women who are in Parliament will talk about the culture of misogyny and bullying that is there. Um, and I'm sure it's the same in Australia. Um, and I'm sure these comments add to it. And I can well imagine that for a lot of young women, there's a sense of, well, if we enter this, we're going to take on all of this nonsense. Do we really want to? Um, and then there's that other question of, 
if you do enter it, do you start internalizing that misogyny? Do you start enacting it on, on other women? Um, it's, it's really very worrying. It's a worldwide problem. Um, but it's, it's not been pleasant to read the newspapers here the last I guess years. the strangest thing about this particular occasion is that it, it came from the former Minister for Women. Uh, it's, uh, does that, that shock you, actually? Yeah. And, and, and it came from a strong woman who's actually been a, a very good mentor to many women in her, her career, and I think that's the key. I mean, Camilla, you, you are absolutely right. We have to do better on this. I think my own experience from before I went into politics was mentoring is actually incredibly important and defining merit in a way which is gender neutral is, is incredibly important as well. We have to do better at that in politics and I think that's, uh, that's work which I know within the Liberal Party there's an enormous amount of work that's been going on in this and, and we have to keep doing it. Right, we've got a young questioner who's picked up on this whole notion. Let's go to Max Mitchell. Hello. Hey, Max. Um, uh, I was wondering, how can the government say it opposes bullying when they are continually slandering and attacking each other? How can they say it's wrong when they practice it? Angus, this must be a widespread feeling out in the community. It's come from a young school, uh, yeah. well, a senior school person there. Yeah, no, Max, and look, you, you ask a fair question, um, and sometimes the parliament doesn't behave as it should, as I said earlier. But, but I think the vast majority of the work that is done in the parliament is done in a respectful way. Uh, and it should be. And, and most of all, you know, what we need to learn from recent weeks is we've got to all folk, everyone on all sides of politics, focus on what Australians want, on what's in the national interest, on what's in the public interest. Getting too caught up in the Canberra bubble is a big mistake. I didn't go into politics and leave a, a private sector career to do that, and, and we have to focus on those things. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, is, it, is this the time now for the coach of the team, if you like, and the Prime Minister in this case, to actually pull the team together and sit them down and say, this has got to stop? I mean, because you well, had a senior minister. First of all, you had Senator Cass, and you had uh, Mr Dutton, Peter Dutton, who's the Minister for Home Affairs, come out and say, uh, warn, actually, that people on the other side know that there's problems with their personal lives, and it, again, it, it had that sort of threatening tone to it. Right, Tony, but, I mean, there's been no shortage of, of, of incidents of, of bullying out from the other side of politics at time. We've seen that from the union movement. And really, that, that's not got, got to be the focus. Would you the like to see that? No, to get back, going back to my question, though, party room, get the Prime Minister, put the team to one side and well, say, we've got to be better than this. I, I think the whole parliament should be constantly asking itself every day how it can do more to further the interests of Australians. I mean, and, and that, that it's is not a job. So it's not, people, in your case, it's not a question for the leader to get involved. Well, it's a question for everyone, Tony, mm. um, on, on all sides of politics, because you can get caught up in that place. It, it's intoxicating for people. You can get caught up in it and you can stop remembering why you're there, who put you there and who you're accountable to. Mm. And that's a question every parliamentarian should be asking themselves every day. All right, let's hear about the intoxication factor from uh, the other side. Um, Tanya Plibersek. Do you ever get intoxicated and say something you wish you'd never <laughs> No. Uh, no. I'd, I think um, the point Angus made earlier about mentoring is really important. And one of the problems with what Michaelia Cash did is if I, I've had um, fantastic male mentors. If you're, a, if you're a man seen alone with a young woman now, the assumption is automatically to this rumour stuff. That's a real problem. Um, and I, I think um, the solution is at least in part about critical mass. And Camilla was talking about um, the still very low numbers of women in Westminster. And of course, while it has improved over the years, they are still very low. That's true of our parliament too, but there is quite a difference. When we set a target in 1994 to have 30% of winnable seats held by women, uh, we meet and beat that target. We raise the target to 40%. We've got a target of 50% now. We are just shy of 50%. Our target was 50% by 2025. We'll get there at the next election six years early. The Liberals were at 14% at the same time in 1994. They're, they're about 20% 20, 20 now. So they're still at one in five because they haven't set targets and prioritised the culture change that comes with building a critical mass of women in the parliament. And it's not just about more equal representation of women and men. It's different ages, it's different work backgrounds, it's different family backgrounds. It's having a parliament that looks more like the Australian people. Uh, that should be a, 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 um, 
a, a goal that every political party sets itself and that the parliament sets itself. Because I think you can't have what Angus is describing, that focus inside the bubble, when people have all of their diverse life experiences drawing them into normal human life outside the parliament. Richard Di Natale. Tanya's right, uh, and I think the problem for the Liberals is even worse when you look at their cabinet. Um, only a short time ago they had one woman in cabinet. Uh, well, both, I, the question was about bullying, and you're both, yeah. you both seem to have gone to gender equality. I mean, <laughs> uh, is that because you think women don't bully? No, I, I, we've got a very proud record on gender equality, and I, you know, we've got my home state of Victoria. We have eight members of the state parliament, seven are, are women. Uh, our leaders are a Tamil Sri Lankan woman. We've just sworn in a, a daughter of Vietnamese refugees. Uh, we've just elected the first Aboriginal woman to the Victorian Parliament. So we've got a very proud record. But, so, but the question but, was about a bullying culture um, yep. that the, the question is obviously so, quite concerned about. Um, I agree. Do, do you think that changing the gender balance would change that? I think it would make a big difference, absolutely. I think it would make a big difference. I think it's a really macho, testosterone fueled environment. And I think having more women, uh, more women perhaps who are less like Michaela Cash, and more like uh, many of the women who are representing... I thought you were going to say, well, like me. Yes. <laughs> Great opportunity more like there. More like Tanya. Um, but there are so many strong, powerful, progressive women in the parliament. And if, you have, if you have more women that but, like Tanya, they'll all belong to the Labor Party. So uh, that, but that can might I, help you. I think there's another thing going on, Tony, that's, I think, part of this. And you've got this sort of very toxic social media culture that's emerged, and that's a problem not just in politics but across society. And I think part of the problem for the Liberal Party, part of the reason we're seeing them so personal, so aggressive, is because when you're a party that's very divided, and there's no secret to the fact that it's a party riven with division, but more importantly, it doesn't actually have an agenda. I don't know what the Liberal Party is trying to achieve in the Parliament. You think about all the big reforms that we're going through at the moment. They're destroying the NBN. They've got no energy policy. Uh, we look at public health and public education, all they're doing is cutting spending. OK, you're, you're, going, you're going party no, no, political. But I was trying to cut but, you off to your minute but I there. Think, I, if, we were, if we had, a, if we had a, a party that was prosecuting an agenda, even one that we didn't, didn't agree with, um, we'd be talking about some of those ideas, but they've got nothing. All right. Let's, Rich, do you stand up in the parliament every day complaining about our agenda, about us wanting to have smaller government, lower taxes, about us wanting to make sure small business has every opportunity to succeed, right. less red tape. OK, so, you, 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 so you're you, very you, conscious you, you, of our You had a perfect right to go party political. <laughs> there, but I'm going to move us on to the next question. It's from David Ellis. My question is to Sherry Markson, but the rest of the panel, please jump in. Hello. In one of your recent articles, you wrote that it is essential that equality exists in the nation's capital. And you've also said that it is hard enough to work in a political environment without rumours being spread. Given these opinions, why did Mr Joyce not deserve a level of privacy surrounding his private life and offered the same courtesy you believe the target of Michaelia Cash's rant does? Interesting question. Uh, they are two completely different topics. So in the one instance with Michaelia Cash, she uh, raised, threatened to name young women who were the subject of rumour uh, when nothing had been proven at all and they are not public figures. And, and, and the, it's not even true as far as I'm aware. In the other instance, you had the Deputy Prime Minister of the country, the second most powerful politician who fills in for the Prime Minister as acting PM when he's away, uh, leaving, who, who has conservative... Uh, family values, has campaigned against same-sex marriage, has campaigned against the Gardasil vaccine because it might make women more promiscuous. You've got this conservative figure, Deputy Prime Minister, who has left his wife and four daughters for a media advisor who is now pregnant. And not only that, but then uh, authorised, so he signed off on the creation of new jobs for her in two politicians within his own party, while living for six months in a free rental from a National Party donor. The two, the two things couldn't be more different. Barnaby Joyce, as when he was Deputy Prime Minister, deserved every ounce of scrutiny that we in the media applied to him. His family didn't, and we were very respectful to his uh, wife and his four daughters, and you know, we never once hassled them. Um, very respectful to them, but, but he, in that role, deserved every ounce of scrutiny. And politicians, when they go into this job, 
they know that they need to be accountable to voters. And you know what, the, the biggest bit of feedback I've had since the story was published, I mean, not from the press gallery who kind of didn't necessarily agree with the story being published in the first place, but the biggest bit of feedback from the community, from voters is, why didn't we know about this before the New England by-election? Let's go, uh, Dave Ellis, you asked the question. I mean, you've heard the, the answer. Do you accept that what Sherry's saying, that a higher standard is, is owed to the public I, by the Deputy Prime Minister? No, I frankly think everyone should be uh, held to the same standard, no matter what. It just seems those two statements of prosecute one person because they're the Deputy Prime Minister, and I'm not suggesting that what Barnaby did was right or wrong or what have you, um, but then to say, no, the other person who's the target of Michaela Cash's rant should not be named and should not... They should be given the utmost privacy, whereas the other person shouldn't. It just seems a touch hypocritical. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to you in one second. Uh, Carmilla just indicated she wanted, had somebody to say, so I'll go to you. Well, I think there are two instances in which a politician's private life becomes public interest. Um, and one is if their public persona their political persona is about something that is actually at odds with how they're living. So if you're going to make a big deal about being all family values, um, then you're setting yourself up for someone to come at you for not being. I mean, it's very striking to me that in Britain, Jeremy Corbyn's wife is never seen with him. He, they've made a conscious effort that he's not going to do that. He's not going to use his marriage. He's not going to use his wife. He's not going to hold his hand or make tea for interviewers or do anything of that sort, it is possible to be a politician and not play the card of this is my wife and family, it represents certain things, I represent those things and you must vote for them. Um, so if someone is doing that, if they're putting themselves forward in that way, then I'm afraid they are open them, opening themselves up in their private life to scrutiny. Um, and the other is if there is any abuse of power or political power particularly in relation to what they're doing. Um, OK, I'll go back to Shari, because you wanted to, to we, respond to Yeah, that. I mean, the key point is one is slur and rumours and untrue, and the other over a long period of time, and I put my first FOI request, Freedom of Information request, last May into this story, so we've been looking at this for a long period of time, was, was carefully checked, um, rigorous journalistic process applied to it, uh, and, and what we published was factual and accurate. So those are completely and different And look, it's arguably the biggest political story of the year, and Barnaby Joyce has stepped down. Um, is it time to leave him alone, or will you continue to pursue stories about the paternity of the child and various other things? No, I, I stopped writing on this about a week and a half ago, moved on to... I interviewed Mike Pizzullo, the new chief of the Home Affairs Department, uh, literally a week and a half ago, and have been writing about all sorts of stories. Qantas is interesting. Uh, Man interruptions, new policy today. Uh, so... I, you, you, know, you know what Barnaby Joyce said, of course, that the, your appearance on this program, um, maybe whatever um, feedback he was getting from your newspaper suggested to him that he was forced into making this disclosure yesterday. About his paternity, very mm. unusual, seeing as uh, um, the, the topics that were suggested for this Q&A had nothing to do with Barnaby Joyce, you know? It, it was all sorts of other topics, including yeah, are, tariffs, and yet we're speaking about, about him again. Um, Tanya Flubisek, I imagine you're thoroughly sick about it, sick of it, but, you know, what's... What? Just, just, just to the general point asked by the questioner there, um, should there be a right to privacy, no matter where you sit within a government? Well, there's certainly a right to privacy. People have a right to their private lives. Um, they don't have a right to spend taxpayers' money in any way they choose without accounting for it. They don't have a right to fail to disclose gifts from donors. That's our only interest. The Labor Party has not been interested in, in his personal life. Um, I, I feel sorry for everybody involved, but that's that's none of our business. And um, I think if I were uh, if I were advising um, Barnaby Joyce, I would I would think a little bit staying stum now would be a good idea. Would um, have been a good idea a week ago. Yeah, I th before I th he did his million Fairfax interview. I, I think um, oh, it's been said before he's he's feeding the hand that bites him at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Richard. Oh, I think that I agree and I think what we should be doing now is um, giving uh, a family or families in a very difficult situation uh, time to process what's happened. Um, I have to say, having read, read his comments over the weekend, I, I was 
sort of lost for words. Uh, I, um, I thought it was a particularly low thing to do, to accuse somebody of, and at this point, I think there's the welfare of former staff, a family with four kids, uh, a child, uh, and I think we should just let them get on and sort out what is a very difficult situation. Angus, I'll, I'll let you respond to this, but in a different way, because we've got a video question uh, from Glenn Gibson in Wentworth Point, New South Wales, about the politics of this, really. Go ahead. Turnbull has lost 28 polls in a row, and I was wondering, why do you think this is? My second part of the question is, the exploits of Cash and Joyce over the last few weeks certainly haven't helped. Uh, do you think this is a contributing factor? And the third thing is, when or if Turnbull gets to 30 consecutive negative polls, do you think it's time for him to resign? In your question, you cannot say that the only poll that counts is on election day. Thank you. <laughs> so, Angus, there goes your answer. <laughs> well, no, I, I, was, I was actually going to give a different answer, which is... And thanks for the question, Glenn. But my, my different answer is I didn't get into politics to watch the news poll. It was not what I got into politics to do. I got into politics... But Malcolm Turnbull got uh, well, into the leadership by watching very closely. But let, let me tell you what my benchmark for what we should be doing is, mm. is good government. So that's 16 months of consecutive jobs growth. That's 1,100 jobs a day. That's a million jobs in the last six... or in six years by the, by the end of the year. Look... They are extraordinary outcomes, and that's what we've got to focus on. That look, I respect the, the the decisions of people like the Daily Telegraph editors to run the stories they want, but Australians want to know about these things because these are the things that really affect their so lives. So you have a really serious problem with party unity, though. Um, and I'll just quote what Tony Abbott said today: um, "It was the Prime Minister who set this test. That is, 30 negative news polls meant you have to leave government effectively. Uh, if he fails the test himself, it'll be up to him." Him to tell us why the test doesn't apply in his case. Well, Tony, I'm telling you that I think the test of good government is the things I've been talking about. Sure, but what, are, what about, what, Tony, what, about what Tony Abbott is asking well, here? Should the, is the Prime Minister under any obligation at all when he gets to 30 negative news polls yeah. to explain why he should stay in power, whereas the previous leader... Could not. I think what the obligation of the Prime Minister is is very simple, which is to explain to the Australian people every day why he is governing for the interests of every Australian and how he's delivering... So, just government. to get this straight, that, that 30, is... 30 negative news polls, that means nothing? Well, 16 consecutive months of jobs growth. I mean, they are the things that actually count. Australians, honestly, in my electorate, I don't turn up at the Goulburn show or, or the Camden show to find people at my stall asking me about the news poll. They're asking me about the investments in infrastructure. They're asking me about the jobs cre mm. job creation. They're asking me about how we're making life better for small businesses and families. That's what they want to know about. Well, we started the year talking about the government's tax policy and we end up weeks later well, talking about this and let's Tony Abbott to hasn't helped you, right? Well, whatever, but I'm interested in good government <laughs> and, and, and the Prime Minister is too. OK. Um, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. <laughs> Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC. That was not meant to come in there. Uh, <laughs> fact check and the conversation website for the results. Now, the next question comes from Sabrina Khan. Go ahead. My question is to you, Camilla. Mm -hmm. um, the question of family loyalty is a challenging one. In your book, Home Fire, the character Isma is singled out and out outcast from her family for telling authorities that her brothers joined ISIS and gone to Syria. Now, my question is, how are Muslims ever supposed to feel accepted and welcome as natural citizens if they have to answer for the questionable choices of their family members? Camilla. Um, there are all kinds of things, I think, these days that are making it very hard for Muslims um, in non-Muslim majority countries to feel themselves accepted. Um, there is all kind of legislation. There are all kinds of headlines, innuendo. Um, there are in Britain. There's a thing called the Prevent Program, which essentially has teachers pretty much spying on their students um, and seeing if they're showing signs of radicalization. Um, and it does include things like have they grown a beard. It's so clearly targeted at Muslims. Um, I don't think the issue is how Muslims should feel welcome and recognised. I think the, the issue right now is how the wider society can get a grip on its Islamophobia. 
um, and how governments can really look at the way they're having these conversations. I mean, there is no reason why someone, because they're related to a criminal, um, should then be treated as though they were the criminal. It's one thing if you think, if you say they were involved in the criminal activity, that's, then they're involved. Um, but the kind of uh, guilt by association that goes on, um, and it's easier to find someone guilty if they don't look like you, if they dress in a different way, um, if they don't have the same habits of socializing as you. It's just much easier to look at them as other and demonize them. And it's been going on now for so many years um, that I think we don't even recognize all the ways in which, at a daily level, um, Muslims are made to feel other, are made to feel that they have to constantly prove their citizenship, they have to prove their loyalty, um, and that they're being watched. I mean, one of the most disturbing things that I heard recently was a friend of mine interviewed 14 and 15 year old Muslim students in Britain, British, ne never lived anywhere else. Um, and there was a 14 year old boy who said he was on a tube and he put his backpack down to take off his jacket. And he suddenly started feeling very guilty that the other people in the, in the tube carriage might worry that there was a bomb in the backpack and he didn't want them to worry. And then he thought, why am I feeling guilty? I've just taken off my jacket. Um, let, let me ask you how your, because a lot of people won't have read your book, I have, um, how it explores these themes. Uh, the character that was just referred to, there's the older sister, Isma. She has two twins, two mm. younger twins, a male and a female, uh, that she's effectively brought up on her own. Mm. Um, she gets into a situation where she has to inform uh, on her brother, who goes, one of the mm. twins, who goes, uh, pervades, who goes to... Um, fight for ISIS, but mm -hmm. not on frontline duties, mm -hmm. but behind the scenes mm -hmm. in propaganda. Um, what's it, what's, what are you trying to get across here? Are you, are you making a case there are some people who join ISIS who should, we should have some sympathy for? Um, I was less interested in making a case than I was in exploring something. One of the things that, that really struck me that that made ISIS different from other terrorist organizations such as Al-Qaeda was that ISIS was actually attempting to set up a state. So they weren't only appealing to fighters. It wasn't just come and fight and kill. Um, and we often think that their propaganda is primarily around violence. And if you actually look at it um, or look at the work of those who studied it, actually violence around the time that I was looking at uh, this in 2015, violence was a very small part of the propaganda. Um, and they were looking at things like belonging, utopia, a welfare state, lack of racism. I mean, these were the ways they were drawing very often very, very young boys. They did in. usually put the violence alongside no, that no. you know, in a very serious way. Well, I mean, no, Angus no, I mean they, we'll come to Angus in a second because well, he's no, shaking his head there. If there's a researcher called Charlie Winter. He looked at several months of... ISIS propaganda, and he, he went percentage-wise, how much percentage was violence, how much was belonging, how, and it was a shock to me, because I really assumed from having read the newspapers that it was all about violence, and what you realise, the really terrifying thing, was how sophisticated and how multi-pronged multi the propaganda was, how much more dangerous even than we'd known, because it... ISIS was saying, we don't just want fighters, we want doctors, we want engineers, we want people who can work in media, we want all kinds of people, um, and we're going to find all kinds of ways to draw them, um, and in particular disaffected young men. Um, and the, the recruitment time was often very short, it could take as little as six weeks between the time of first contact and someone going off to Syria. I mean, it was... It was completely... Camilla, I'm going, yeah. I'm going to just interrupt to, to yeah. bring you to a key point because mm. um, the character Pervez, as we yeah. say, joins ISIS. Mm. Then he realises he's made a terrible mistake yeah. and he wants to come home. But mm. the, the new citizenship laws mm -hmm. that strip away the citizenship yeah. of jihadis yeah. have come into play here mm -hmm. and he can't come home. Mm. Are you actually saying that we should be sympathetic to this character? What I'm saying, in particular the citizenship laws... And it's the same in Australia as in the UK. Um, my problem with those laws particularly is they apply to those who are dual nationals. What it means then is you have two kinds of laws for Australian citizens. So if two different people have committed the same crime, there must be the same punishment. There must be. There must be the same laws. You can't say, well, actually, your grandparents were born in Pakistan um, and therefore you are entitled to a Pakistani passport so we're going to have a different set of rules for you. 
It's not democratic. OK, let's, let's bring in Angus here. You've been listening to this, and um, you, you may or may not have read the book, but mm. it does. It, it's a very interesting story. Mm. And, you know, you do get into the mind of this guy who's gone there mm. and realised he's made a shocking error of judgment and mm. wants to reverse it and come back home. Mm. Um, should, there be, should any country accept um, the return of former jihadis? Well, I mean, people who make shocking errors of judgment and their criminal errors have to pay... Mm -hmm. The, the consequences. They have to be accountable for those actions. And you know, the Australian people have made very clear that they want to see strong laws on foreign fighters um, and that we should enforce those laws. Now, one of the tools in that toolkit is stripping dual citizens of their Australian citizenship. Uh, and we think that's appropriate for people who have gone and fought for terrorist organisations. These are not these are terrorist organisations, Tony. So uh, we firmly believe that this is good policy, it's the right thing to do and it's well supported by the I'll just, I'll just go around the panel quickly on this. Uh, Richard? Uh, well, I'd rather that if criminals commit a criminal act that they be prosecuted as criminals. And, and I think that's why we have laws that uh, prohibit certain activities and membership of certain organisations and I think... That's the whole point of having those laws. But you couldn't really gather criminal evidence against someone who's worked for ISIS in Raqqa, for example, and unless you manage to bring over witnesses to say what they've done. Well, well what, we you're then what you're then arguing is that uh, there should be a lower standard to strip someone of their citizenship. And citizenship is a fundamental right. We don't want governments to be able to arbitrarily strip people of their citizenship. So well, I, we think do we just, to... I think Vangus is, uh, oh, if I right. understand what he's saying, he's saying it's dual citizens. So basically you take away well, the Australian part of it and you leave them... I think, I think what, Angus, what Angus said earlier also was that if people commit crimes, they should be prosecuted. And I think that's what we know. I'd, I'd rather somebody who's committed a crime, uh, good people make shocking decisions, and, and the book is a fascinating sort of insight um, into how somebody can be uh, effectively brainwashed um, through the use of this propaganda. Uh, but ultimately, I'd rather that person be prosecuted here and be incarcerated. Uh, and perhaps we learn a little more about how we prevent those activities happening rather than giving somebody licence to continue perpetrating those activities overseas and putting other people at risk. Sherry Markson. I think our laws currently are too weak. I think they are far too weak. There is a problem where we've had uh, foreign fighters, so let's just call them terrorists because that's what we're talking about, terrorists who are not dual nationals or they might be but the government hasn't been able to prove that they're entitled to the citizenship of another country because, you know, the Iraqi or Syrian authorities aren't cooperating. And so the terrorists have been able to come back to Australia there's not enough evidence to put them behind bars. And so it requires 24-hour surveillance from our security authorities to ensure that these people don't cause a mass casualty attack. And the fear is, the very real concern is that this is going to happen and it will emerge that it was a, a returning foreign fighter. Our security agencies knew this, but our laws were too weak. So what is happening at the moment is there's a debate within the Turnbull government, a debate at cabinet level, uh, to implement some of the newer British laws, which actually remove British citizenship from a terrorist if the government believes they might be entitled to it and, and they can s strip them of British citizenship temporarily so that we actually will be able to leave someone stateless, which, which of course is very controversial. George Brandis didn't agree with it. Uh, my understanding is Malcolm Turnbull doesn't agree with it. Um, but there are others within the cabinet like Peter Dutton who are supportive of this. So this is a okay. live issue. I'm going to come to Tanya in a minute, but I just want to go back to uh, Kamala. You've heard mm. the debate and it sounds like Australia is moving closer to the British model. What do you say? Look, I think you have to trust your system of justice. You have to trust your judicial system. You can't say, well, we don't have the laws to deal with this problem. That's really a cop-out. Um, fix the laws to deal with the problem in country. I agree you have to prosecute. Surely joining a terrorist organization is a crime. Prosecute on that basis. Also governments, certainly the British government has the ability to withdraw people's passport, which means they can't come in, which not withdrawing their citizenship, which is another little loophole they, they can use but don't. Uh, but primarily I think you can't, you can't say that with this, I mean, you have all manner of crimes being committed some of them on a very large scale, uh, not 
only terrorist acts, you have serial killers, you have all kinds of things. Um, it's only with the terrorists that there's this total panic, which is, I'm afraid, related to the idea that they're not, let's face it, this is what we're really talking about. They're not really one of us, right? They're not really Australian. They're not really British. That's at the heart of this, which is what people don't talk about. But if they declare war in our country, if yeah. they reject our very values, then they're not Australian and they don't deserve to be Australian. Well, first of all, a lot of people who, I mean, there is this, the peculiarity of ISIS is that you did have people going to say, well, I want to be a doctor in Raqqa. Okay, so now you've got a doctor in Raqqa who wants to come back. It's a slightly different you, I mean, thing. Can, can you have sympathy, though, for someone who, even though if they go to become a doctor, they yeah. know that on the very propaganda mm. that enlisted them, yeah. uh, also there are images like the execution of a Jordanian pilot by burning him alive in a cage, um, yeah. the beheading of Western journalists and mm. others. I mean, it's so appalling. It's it so, so beyond appalling. the scope Look, of human imagination. there's nothing in that me that is defending mm. that. Um, but first of all, what about the 17-year-old? What about the 16-year-old? There are 14-year-olds who go. Um, are we really going to say, well, you were 16 and there was incredibly good propaganda and there were recruiters who within six weeks turned you, but that's it, your life is over? Are you really going to let's, say that to a 16-year-old? Let's, let's hear what Tanya Plibersek has to say about this. Well, the first priority of a government is to keep its citizens safe. And when you're talking about returning foreign fighters, uh, it, you know, it's right to say there should be a, a um, examination of their crimes if you can prosecute them, prosecute them, put them in jail. But hang on a minute. How are we gathering evidence in war zones? How, how do we prove that uh, people have committed the crimes that they've been accused of. It's a very difficult thing to expect our police uh, and our intelligence services to be able to prove that. So there is a natural caution about anybody who has travelled overseas. Uh, they say they weren't there to fight. How do we know? How do we know that? There's a, a We've had an Australian doctor who went over, who uh, I think was a paediatrician from Western Australia, who said he went... Uh, to be a doctor. I don't know that he wasn't fighting when he was there. I don't know that he was saving lives, not taking them. Um, I, I frankly wouldn't shed a tear for any Australian who went to fight and lost their life, stayed there. I wouldn't shed a tear. The people um, I'm most worried about are the kids who've been taken there by their parents, uh, the children who are born in war zones over there. Um, I think that's a different matter. If people have made no decision to go and have been taken by parents who I think have engaged in child abuse by taking their, their children there or having children there, uh, that's a different matter. I'll just I'll give you the final word and then we have to move on. I think there's a problem if you're dropping the idea of innocent until proven guilty. How can you prove someone guilty when I there mean, is no, there is no way to gather evidence in I Syria? We don't I grew up in intelligence citizenship. There. Look, we I haven't got the appropriate evidence. Doesn't that just undercut the? To become a citizen of a country, to be rendered stateless, and what we're arguing for is a lower threshold. We're saying Peter Dutton can make a decision about whether he thinks well, you may have committed a crime. He will remove your citizenship and you will be rendered stateless. So he Richard, can't that's do that at the law. moment. That's not the law. And, that's and, and that's let's where be, we're heading. Very, that, that is exactly, be, well, that you're, is you're, exactly you're, where you're we're heading. And that's the and debate that Shari... You don't know. I, ho I hope that's right. where we're heading. You don't know. We, well, I hope we're not. But, <laughs> but what, what, is, hope we're what not. is crucial here is these people have committed acts of violence. I mean, we saw that terrible picture of the young kid... And they would be prosecuted. ..carrying a severed And hand. they would be prosecuted. And that's evidence. These are of, atrocious acts. of most of them. And, and they need, they need a proportionate response, and, and that means it's very significant. Uh, just, well, we just, have... just, just on the young kid, because it's a point I think that Tanya made earlier, yeah. um, he should be allowed to come back to Australia, right? Because he's been abused by a parent. Isn't he just an Australian who look, suffered abuse? Look, I'm not going to go into individual cases on well, how the law... Reasons. Well, well I am talk, I'm talking about the illustration of, of the violence yeah. that's involved here, yeah. Tanya. And, 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 of course, that is a very, very serious issue, as you, as you know. So. OK, now, I was going to give you the final word, so I'll do it. It sounds to me like you're actually advising Britons not to take up dual citizenship. Um, there are plenty of my friends whose children have dual citizenship so that they can go home and visit Granny. Even though, and, you know, I say to them, are you quite sure what you're doing here? Look, my real, I grew up in a military di dictatorship. I grew up in a country where civil liberties were eroded in the name of security. 
when I see democracies moving in that direction, my radar goes up. You don't want to do it. It's a very, very slippery slope. You have to find another way within your democratic institutions to make things work. All right. Thanks for an interesting debate. We're going to move on. You're watching Q&A. Uh, we'll go to another topic now, back to Australian politics. Next question comes from Greg Black. Thanks, Tony. Uh, in the Tasmania election on the weekend, <clears throat> whatever it was the Greens were selling, uh, the <laughs> Tasmanian electorate wasn't buying it on the weekend. So what lessons do the Greens take from the election in order to avoid a prolonged slide into Australian Democrat style irrelevance. Ouch. Good question. That hurts. Great question. <laughs> You're not going to ask me about the Queensland election a few months before that, where we got somebody elected for the first time and saw a huge swing in our vote, or maybe the Northgate by election, where we saw the first Aboriginal woman elected to the state pump. No, look, Tassie was a, not a great result. It was a very disappointing result. That's an understatement. No sugar coating. It was a, it was a terrible result for the Greens. Oh, look, I think there's a few things to take out of that. Um, it's interesting, uh, a lot of the... I think the Liberals benefited from a tourism-led economic recovery and the foundations for that were laid during the power-sharing agreement. I mean, at the time w when the Greens were part of the government, at the time the Liberals wanted to chop down every last tree in Tassie and now we've got ecotourism at the centre of their economy. We've got the clean green image, we've got good food and wine. We've so got no, no need for the Greens? Is that what, is well, that what the Tasmanian voters are saying? What, what I'm we've, saying? We've achieved all the Green issues, now we don't need the Greens. What I'm saying is uh, we're there to actually try and implement change and we're seeing that the fruits of that and the Liberals have, have benefited from it. That's part of it. I, I think the other thing to take out of it very clearly is that when you take on a big and powerful vested interest like the Pokies lobby, uh, you've got to be prepared uh, to counter the millions of dollars that, flew, that, that, that came into Tassie and effectively bought that election. I, it, was a, it was a fundamental shift in, I think, uh, state politics where you saw a big, powerful interest group gambling money. This is money that's made on the back of the misery of others. Uh, come into the state, you couldn't... I went to Tassie during the election campaign, you could not escape it. You went to a restaurant and at the bottom of a docket you had, don't vote for the Greens, don't vote for Labor. Um, yeah, come, right, and I'm just going to just, just pause you there, I'll come back to you, yep. but uh, Tanya Plibsek might want to come in here because did, did well, Labor in Tasmania make a fundamental error of judgment in taking on the poker machine gaming lobby? No. Uh, and, uh, I mean, the campaign... Um, <laughs> there was big money in the campaign from um, all the vested interests that Richard's described, but Labor improved its vote. In fact, um, Beck White was the only, you know, led the only party that improved its vote. So I don't think you can say it's just about poker machines. She, she was incredibly gutsy to take on that policy, knowing that uh, millions of dollars would be um, thrown against her, and it was, and uh, she did incredibly well. So I don't think but, it was uh, a mistake. But, uh, strategically... Um, it's got, not you, something that any state Labor uh, look, government has ever a, done, I don't this think. This was a real turning point. Like the, the question was, are we going to renew these licences for another 20 years? It was a point-in-time decision uh, to stand up and say, no, this is causing too much misery. And, and I think people gave her credit for standing up for what she believed in. I think she did a great job, great campaign, right, great before job. Before I go to the other panellists, Richard, let's come back to you. Um, yeah. You've got a by-election coming up, yep. the Batman by-election um, in Victoria. And, if you don't win there either, um, is that going to be one of those moments where people like our questioner are going to say, well, the Greens have peaked, they're on the way down? I, I, Tony, I've heard that for probably the last 15 years. So it doesn't, uh, we're not matter, going it doesn't matter if you we're win Batman. Not we'd like to win Batman, Tony. Um, we'd like to do well in Batman. We'd like to do well at the next election. Um, what, the, what the Tassie election, show, uh, election showed is that you need to get big money out of politics. It's why the Greens have been campaigning on donations reform and we've got to make sure we do something in this term of a federal parliament. That's so you can we keep want to, the funding we from want to get, get up, We want to get rid of big... We don't get a cent from Get Up, shall we? Not a cent. Not one cent. Um, the, we, we need to get rid of that big money out of politics. We need to get rid of the revolving door between lobbyists and uh, the parliament. Uh, we need a national anti-corruption watchdog. We need all of those things. In Batman, uh, the people of Batman are saying to us they want action on climate change. That means stopping Adani. They want to close those camps so that we can bring innocent people, asylum seekers, here to Australia to contribute. They want a fairer economy, one that looks after people, 
rather than giving big corporate tax cuts to their uh, rich mates. Look, well, um, it, can so I, yes, it, you can go. Yes, I can. Uh, we've got a um, we've got a candidate in Batman who was a nurse for decades, and then she led the fight against John Howard's work choices. We've got a candidate who spent her life caring for people and standing up for them. Not a candidate about whom the Greens own party members are writing 101 page documents about what you know their political behaviour is like. We've got positive policies, not just about one or two issues. We took more than 100 policies to the last federal election. Uh, we've added to those now. People won't forget that the Greens voted with the Liberals to cut pensions. 370,000 right. pensioners right. lost $2.4 billion. They won't forget that the Greens wanted to vote to cut education spending. Leary Annan lost her job. She's not going to be a senator in the future because she stood up for public funding for public we all did. schools. We didn't support no, it. No, you didn't. You we didn't, didn't vote support it. We you, didn't vote the, for it. At, at the last minute. We didn't minute, vote for it. At the we, last we minute, didn't Richard. Vote for it. We okay, saw so you and Sarah Hanson Young mini, wanting. It's quite good fun, though, isn't it? The Batman the by election. <laughs> <laughs> they won't <laughs> that they that forget that the Greens voted with the Liberals. Tanya, you just have to let the other side You can throw in a dime. We still don't have. Carbon pricing, because the Greens voted with the Liberals okay, okay. to cut the CPRS. Tanya, okay, you better, you, you People made won't a, forget that. First of all, you've made an accusation about the candidate, um, which was... In, it's not my in, accusation, in the, it's 18 Greens um, party members. It was an members. accusation of bullying. You yep. might want to respond to that. Uh, well, that's been reviewed by the party, it's been considered, and those allegations uh, were dismissed. Um, look, the difference between the Greens candidate and the Labor candidate is the Labor candidate will talk about a bunch of things that she believes in, when it comes to stopping Adani, it's the Greens candidate who will vote to stop that mine. Well, vote, Shorten, vote on Bill what? Which legislation? Bill Shorten. What's okay, the piece okay. of legislation? Both of you, both of you I, pause. I What's both the of you, piece of I'm legislation? Sorry, I'm, excuse I, me, I'm going to put you both on pause because we've got a question <laughs> on this subject. I'm just going to quickly go to it. Uh, it's from Jeremy Yelland. Go ahead, Jeremy. Good evening. Former Labor leader and Prime Minister Bob Hawke once famously said, I find offence a very uncomfortable place to squat my bottom. <laughs> Bob is regarded as Australia's most popular Prime Minister, in part because he did not drop his moral compass when faced with opposition. The same cannot be said for Bill Shorten, especially in reference to the proposed Adani-run Carmichael coal mine in the Galilee Basin. Could the Deputy Leader of the Opposition please clarify the ALP's position on the proposed mine and confirm if and when the public will hear the Leader of the Opposition confirm the same? Well, the, the position's very clear. If it doesn't stack up environmentally or economically, it shouldn't go ahead. I don't think it does stack up environmentally or economically. But we're not like the Greens. We have to think about jobs in Queensland too. So we've gone to Queensland with a plan to uh, um, extend the Gladstone Port Road, to build the Rookwood Weir, to expand the uh, channel in Townsville Port. We actually have to answer the questions of Queenslanders about what kind of jobs they're doing in the future. We're also not like the Liberals. We don't get to walk into Parliament with a lump of coal and say coal is good and not care about the environment. We actually have to have a, uh, a realistic policy that addresses the fact that so, the so can Adani just, can't do get you go in, Do you actually go in metaphorically um, and say coal might be good? I don't know what that question means. We've got, <laughs> like, honestly, we've got... We've got if you're waiting for whole, an answer. We've got whole communities right now that still rely on coal mining jobs. Nevertheless, our country is transitioning to a low carbon future. The whole world is. So we need to transition with them. We need to attract investment in renewables. Uh, we need to make sure that um, we've got the energy sources of the future and the jobs that support them. When we're in government, uh, we went from about 7,000 solar rooftop panels to over a million on households around Australia. We tripled employment uh, in the renewable sector. We tripled wind energy. Of course we have to transition, but we don't get to have the simplistic... Like, Richard says stop Adani, and, and he says she'll vote against it, this candidate. In, on what legislation? In what bill? OK, like, Tanya, it's just you, you've posed a nonsense. rhetorical question. We'll go to the other side of the argument. Go ahead. So Bob Hawke didn't say, oh, well, if the f case for damning the Franklin doesn't stack up environmentally or economically, we might think about stopping it. What he said was, it's not going ahead. You vote for Labor, that dam won't be built. That's what he said. 
Uh, Bill Shorten's up in Queensland, spruiking the Adani mine to Queensland, just saying it's just another project. Coal's got a long-term future. Th that's not true. And then he's down in uh, uh, Melbourne saying, well, we, we're waiting to see the business case. It's got to stack up economically. But saying actually, a very different... It's not Bill right, Shorten Richard. is he said today all over the place like on this. They could stop this mine tomorrow. If Bill Shorten said under a Labor government, this mine's not going ahead, it wouldn't go ahead. He hasn't said that. The bottom line is he can't trust Labor on it. This is the same party that slashed the renewable energy target, that took money out of the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, voted with the Liberals to do both of those things. It's the same party that in 2010 went to the election saying, no price on carbon, we're going to have a citizens' assembly. If you're serious about taking strong action on climate change and benefiting from the enormous jobs that are created, not to mention leaving a, st a safe and secure climate for your kids and your grandkids, then you vote Green. But the, if you want the Adani mine to go ahead or you want to leave a big question mark over it, vote for Labor. That's the choice of people in Batman. Tanya, the, the reason, Tanya, the Tanya, Tanya I'm, I'm going to go to the other side of the panel and we'll come back to you. It's because of the Greens, Tanya, voting just, with the Libs. Tanya, I'm still a moderator. We, we, we interact uh, <laughs> together. Let's go to... Let's hear from the other side. And the government obviously supports the Adani mine, so you'd be um, sort of against the Greens completely and partly against Labor because they haven't decided. Well, i tell you what's so fascinating about what we've seen decided, here, Tony. Tony. OK, you we'll come back... Keep and you can saying that. Just let me finish, Tanya. What's so fascinating about what we're watching here is this showdown tells us everything about the great challenge for the modern Labor Party, which is, on the one hand, they have an inner-city educated elite that they've got to appeal to, who are typically increasingly becoming the domain of the Greens, and, and then, on the other hand, they've got to try and win the traditional working-class Labor voters in places like Townsville, in the regional cities and centres. And the problem, Tanya, is you can't narrowcast. You can't say one thing to one group and one thing to another. But that's what Bill Shorten does but every day. We are actually and trying to govern for the whole country. That, that is... Yeah, yeah that but is you can enough. only have one policy I'll, I'll tell on you a what, particular Angus, issue. Why is it that the Liberals won't run a candidate in Batman? Because they want the Greens to win. Ask yourself, why do the Liberals want the Greens to win? Ask yourself. Because we're great. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think, you know, we're going to leave it there because I think we've heard the entire Batman debate um, <laughs> over about, well, maybe too long. Um, it's time for one last question. It's a very different one. It comes from Craig Bailey. Is it ethical that Pine Gap utilises information and data to murder people with drone strikes within nations neither at war with Australia or the United States of America? Is it time for Australian leaders to drop the policy of strategic dependence, a policy very often not in our national interests, and adopt a policy of strategic independence? Richard Dinatale. Great question. And, yes, we need to fundamentally reassess the relationship with the US. I think it's a relationship that's making us less safe rather than safer. Uh, we'll continue to have a relationship with the US, but at the moment what we're doing is it's all one-way traffic. We continue to uh, allow the US to operate on Australian territory through Pine Gap and military bases right through the northern part of Australia. And, of course, as part of this sort of growth in the military-industrial complex, we've got a government that is now saying that the future of Australia is to grow our arms industry. Uh, they want to export weapons of war, of violence and death, as the pathway to future prosperity for this country, when instead we should be investing in technologies that help people. I think you've gone, life -saving you've gone way beyond the question there. Well, no, I'm going to no, pass I think it's, to, I think I it's broad, on broader this. part you of the can, defence question. Get back into it. Yep. Sherry. Uh, the, our intelligence sharing with the United States, I think, is incredibly important. Back to our earlier conversation about detecting terrorists. Uh, some of the terror attacks that have been picked up in Australia recently, uh, we've only found out about them because of our US partners and the ability they have to detect these things. So, and that has to be a two-way street. Um, on the broader point to what Richard just said, um, the relationship with the US is incredibly important, not just for national security, but even the, the conversation, the debate that's happening at the moment with uh, Trump trying to put in 25% or up to 25% tariffs for aluminium and steel. And it's, it's all down to whether the Prime Minister basically in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Trump can convince him <laughs> to have an exemption for Australia, which doesn't look like it's happening at the moment, but, but that's what it comes down to. And, and our leverage is, is our relationship, is our alliance. You know, something that Richard over here uh, wants to disregard. 
Um, actually, go ahead. Questioner wants to get back in, and I'll go to. Couldn't oh. um, like so. You've got China and you've got America, and so neither side wants to go to war with each other. But Japan alters that equation quite dramatically, and couldn't the use of Pine Gap, the information from there, to do any sort of offensive capabilities, cause Australia to be embroiled in a conflict not in our national interest? And the other question to you, Richard, would be... No, no, I'm going to leave that as a comment, because <laughs> okay. you had a question. We'd still like to hear from other people answering it. And Carmela, what do you think? Drone strikes, Pakistan, it's been a huge issue. It's been a huge issue. And look, there's no one around this table who has more of a stake in Pakistan having fewer terrorists than I do. Um, but again, drone strikes, it's, it's back in that old area of let's let go of all civil liberties, let's let go of due process. You can just decide, you know, we have the intelligence, that person there, let's drop the bomb on them. And every so often, other people around them as well. But, you know, that's collateral damage. Um, when you bring these new technologies into the world, you have to consider the fact that it's not ever going to only be you who is using that. I mean, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right, to begin with. You don't say, well, we have this very good purpose for which we're going to use it, um, because it's going to have repercussions on the ground. Um, and once you've got that technology, other people are going to use it. And the idea of... I mean, the number of people who've been killed by drone strikes, and we just have to take someone's word that they were guilty. Barack Obama signed something to say that any male over the age of 16 killed by a drone strike is an enemy combatant. I mean, it's the most shocking thing, right? If you belong to a certain demographic and you're in the rotten place at the wrong time and we kill you, you are guilty. Does Australia really want to be part of that? Angus. Well, I, I agree with Sherry, which is that this intelligence sharing with the United States we do is unbelievably important. And in my area, in cyber security, for instance, our ability to identify, to detect and to respond quickly to very aggressive viruses, ransomware and so on, which can shut down businesses, shut down government, shut down community organisations, depends on our ability to collaborate with countries like the United States. So it's extremely important and, and uh, I think we are right to continue to forge that alliance in a positive way. Tanya Plibersek. Uh, I think uh, independence within the alliance is really important. We should always make uh, decisions based on our national interest. And we did the wrong thing when we followed the US into the Vietnam War. We did the wrong thing when we followed the US into the Iraq War. We should have been more independent within the alliance at that time. Um, I don't think, uh, however, that you can discount the importance of the Five Eyes intelligence sharing arrangements. They have, um, as others have said, uh, kept us safe at, at different times. So uh, the balance has to be um, independence, uh, um, intelligence sharing, I support that. And uh, I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about what the Trump presidency means for uh, Australia's relationship with the United uh, with the United States, our, um, our um, strategic relationship with the United States. I, I think it's important to um, take a long-term view of these things and to consistently say Australia's national interests within a, a good, solid friendship. Uh, Richard, I did cut you off earlier. We're nearly out of time, but you can uh, jump back in. Final word. Uh, look, just to say that Australia's security um, depends on us having an independent, non-aligned foreign policy. We continue to have a relationship with the US, but at the moment, being linked to the US, particularly with Donald Trump as president, makes us a much less safe place. Now, that's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Tanya Plibersek, Richard Di Natale, Shari Markson, Carmela Shamsi and Angus Taylor. Now, you can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live, where Scott Wales is joined by Simon Cowan from the Centre for Independent Studies. Next Monday on Q&A, a close look at our booming population. Australia now has the fastest rate of population growth in the developed world, but are we equipped to deal with 39 million Australians by 2050? Following a special Four Corners on the issue, we'll take the debate further with the former Foreign Minister and New South Wales Premier, Bob Carr,
Sustainability advocate Tim Flannery, Executive Director of the New South Wales Property Council, James Fitzgerald, and the CEO of the Grattan Institute, John Daly. Stay tuned for other guests. Until next week's Q&A, good night. Tomorrow, the Catalyst team get under the surface... Hello, welcome. ...to find out the latest 